who is a PhD candidate in biological sciences. Specialising in applied human camouflage. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> um, and then next up, we're going to have Zoe Laughlin, um, who is an artist and co-founder and director of the Making Institute. Um, and lastly, we're going to have John M. Hull, who's a professor of religious education at the University of Birmingham. Um, and then we're going to have 20 minutes um, for a quick Q&A. Um, and then we're going to be showing um, a film called Notes on Blindness, um, which is a, a film about John, um, which is co-directed and produced by Peter Middleton, who we've also got here this evening. Hi. <laughs> um, if I can just remind you all to turn off your phones, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and this evening's talk um, is free and we really want to keep all of our events free. So um, if you have the opportunity on your way out, it would be wonderful if you can sign up to be a friend. Um, it's 30 pounds for a year's membership, um, and it means that we get to do lots of other lovely events like this. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the talk, and I'll pass you over to Laszlo. Okay. Hello. Oh, it's a bit too close. Um, yeah, hello everyone, uh, I'm Laszlo, I'm from the University of Bristol, and I come here to talk about camouflage tonight. So, when I say camouflage, probably a lot of images jump into your head. Something like this, this oh, the aspect ratio is a bit weird. Anyway, um, something like this, this is an emperor um, dragonfly, which is, um, you can see, beautifully green and um, black disruptive uh, colors on it. Or something like this, which is a praying mantis. It's just right here if you can't see it. Or a tiger, the uh, wild um, cat, or actually domesticated cats do camouflage as well. Um, not surprisingly, humans do it as well. Um, this is uh, Liu Bellin, uh, a Chinese artist who is famous of um, standing in different scenes, staying completely invisible, well, almost invisible. And obviously, um, from the past 100 years, um, humans applied camouflage to military purposes as well, such as this uh, aircraft, or actually wearing uh, camouflage uh, uniforms. So that is my area of, um, of the whole camouflage uh, sphere, looking at how um, humans uh, use uh, uniform, um, camouflage uniforms and how um, uniforms evolved and, uh, and their patterns, how they evolved over the past uh, 100 years. But we've got a whole camo lab set up in Bristol. Um, people looking at uh, vastly different things. So we are supervised by Professor Ines Scalfield, Dr. Nick Scott Samuel, and Dr. Roland Badley. Um, and the students here are displayed on the right, um, all doing very, very different things. So uh, Jim and Konstantinos uh, are looking at um, um, moths and frogs uh, coloration. Olivia and Tim are looking at automatic camouflage assessment using uh, machine vision approaches. Um, Simon is looking at fish. Uh, Fang is looking at um, uh, moth camouflage in, in the forest. Um, George is looking at eye spots. And Ben is looking at um, motion camouflage, such as something like what uh, zebras do. Um, we just launched a brand new website a couple of days ago. So if you're interested in what we are doing, uh, please go to camolab.com. OK, so to talk about camouflage today, I'm going to ask, uh, ask four questions. 
What is camouflage? What do we call camouflage? How does it work? Talk about how it all started and a bit about the human aspect, um, how we humans use camouflage. So just to start with a bit of definitions. So biologists define camouflage as uh, a term uh, to describe all forms of concealment, including those strategies preventing detection, such as crypsis, which I will talk about in a bit, and recognition, uh, for example, masquerade. And to contrast this with a, a more applied thing, so what actually the military uses as, camo uh, as a term for camouflage, um, is the purposeful degradation of a target signature with the objective of reducing an enemy's ability to detect the presence of the target and identify its type. So that sounds a bit weird, but um, the main point is if you look at, they're all talking about the same thing. So something that interferes with either detection or recognition. So detection means I'm completely unaware that there's something in my visual scene. Um, and recognition is that I'm actually, I know there is an object there, but I fail to recognize there's something that I might be interested in. Um, one very important thing to, to, to mention in the very beginning is the very first definition of camouflage, that was the very first time this word got written down, is the act of hiding anything from enemies termed camouflage. So there's a bit of, bit of a problem here with the word hiding. So here's an example. It's a little fox, and there are two frogs in the scene. One is camouflaged, one is just hiding behind the bush. And the frog, uh, sorry, the fox uh, fails to see both of them because uh, this frog is camouflaged and the, the bush is occluding um, his uh, field of vision. But when we talk about camouflage, we only refer to this, uh, this phenomenon um, and this is, this is hiding. This is, you know, um, if, if there is a rabbit hiding in, in its rabbit hole, um, then the fox have no chance to see it. So Edmonds in 1974 defined this um, as so, uh, camouflage needs to be in plain sight. Um, so tonight is all about invisibility. So you can ask the question, well, but why didn't nature evolve just to be completely visible, uh, invisible? Um, so this was in the news a couple of days ago. Um, it's, a, it's a salp, it's not a fish. It's, um, it's more closer to the very uh, ancestors of uh, vertebrates and in, in water, uh, it's almost completely invisible. Um, so why not? Why, why not nature, why, why not all the animals just become invisible so nothing can see them, nor the predators or the prey, uh, nor the, um, the prey, sorry, nor, neither the predators nor the prey. Um, and that answer comes from a uh, biologist uh, from the uh, late um, 19th century and early, early the 20th century. Uh, Edward uh, Poulton said that um, it's okay that natural selection makes things to look more um, concealed, but uh, it's actually important in certain aspects of animal lives to be seen, such as I want to hide from my enemies, but I want my friends and my uh, potential mates to recognize me. Um, and another thing is um, nothing wants to be uh, invincible. Uh, they just want to survive, as uh, Julian uh, Huxley said. So now that we defined what we mean by camouflage, let's look at how does it work. So here's a mountain goat. And um, obviously, uh, the simplest way camouflage can work is to look like the background. And this is termed uh, background matching. One uh, specific uh, um, type of background matching, uh, counter shading. Many fish use this. So basically, the idea here is that if you look at this uh, shark from above, you see its dark back, and it's going to be uh, seen uh, against uh, the, the depth of the sea, which is uh, completely um, pitch black. But if you look at the shark from beneath, then you're going to see it against the sun, where actually the white coloration helps um, to stay um, unseen. Um, but there is a problem with background matching. There is a, there is a huge trade-off. Um, namely that it only works in a given environment. So as soon as you move somewhere which doesn't look like your colors, well, everybody, you're very, very conspicuous at that point. So another technique um, animals use is called disruptive coloration. 
So the idea here is to have very, very contrasting markings on your body, such as this uh, light green and um, dark green, which are actually more salient than the edge of your body. So you look at, the, you look at, uh, you look at this frog, and it's, it's not apparent at the first time that it's actually a frog. It's very visible, um, but it's hard to find the actual shape of the animal. So Hugh B. Cott uh, talked about um, a special type of uh, disruptive coloration, which, uh, which is um, maximum disruptive contrast. So the idea here is, as I said, is that these markings need to be as contrasting as possible. So here are some drawings from his uh, 1940 book. Um, and, well, sorry, the, the quality is not that good. It, it, it's, a, it's a photo. Uh, but you can see here the idea that there is a fish up there having bright um, disruptive markings. And in an environment where those bright markings are present, it's actually very hard to see the, the shape. And the same thing goes with, uh, with the deer and, um, and the bird. Um, so how do scientists actually look at um, how these techniques work? So one basic approach we use in Bristol is have um, these little artificial moths, which are basically just paper triangles, pinned on the trees in Lee Woods, which is a big forest next to Bristol. Um, and on the pins there usually there is a mealworm. And the, the cardboard, is, they're having different uh, patterns uh, based on the study. Um, and we can measure the survivability of these uh, mealworms, because birds come and try to take it. But if the coloration, if the, the pattern, the camouflage is quite good, the birds find it harder, so the, the mealworms would survive more. So we ch check it like every hour, so every first hour, second hour, fourth hour, eighth hour, first day. Um, it depends on the study. Okay, so another form of camouflage is when you deal with, um, you, so you, you try to hinder recognition, um, it's called masquerade. So the idea here is to look something um, from your background that is actually not of the interest of um, the predator looking for you or the prey you are trying to catch. So this frogfish uh, look, looks like um, a piece of um, coral. Or another good example would be an orchid mantis standing just right here, um, which is very, very deceiving, uh, especially for bees. Um, a similar concept is called um, Batesian mimicry, uh, named after Henry Walter Bates. Um, he was a biologist in the 19th century. The idea here is that you're trying to impersonate something that is actually dangerous. So this is a hoverfly, it's not a bee, um, and it doesn't have a sting, uh, stinger, so it's, it's, it's completely harmless. But as it looks like a bee, uh, predators uh, tend to avoid it. And uh, a very stunning example of this is the larvae of the hawk moth, uh, which looks like a tiny little snake. So it's actually the head of the, um, the hawk moth is up there. This is the tail. And it wiggles it around like a snake would with, um, with its head. So a lot of things you can see, they're very, very different forms of, of camouflage. But can we actually explain everything? So I was a painter um, early, um, the late 19th century, early 20th century, Abbott Henderson Thayer. He was uh, from um, North Hampshire in uh, New Hampshire, sorry, uh, in the United States. And he claimed that basically every coloration of animals um, is related to camouflage. This famous example was uh, this is one of his paintings, a peacock. And he said the reason a peacock has uh, a blue neck is it's seen against the, the blue sky. Uh, or another crazy idea was that flamingos are pink because they are seen against the setting or um, the, um, the setting sun, which uh, colors the, uh, the, the sky uh, pink. Um, and it was actually Theodore Roosevelt, the late US president, who said that this is, this is just completely crazy and the theory has been applied way too much. You can't actually explain everything by camouflage. At some point, you have to think about things like uh, sexual selection. Um, so a, a blue, uh, the blue neck of the peacock uh, is there to actually impress females. 
Um, so it's yes. So basically, the answer to that question is no. No, you can't. You have to think, uh, take into take other theories into account when you're trying to explain um, animal coloration. So let's just look at a bit of a history of one when when did camouflage evolve? So vision in nature evolved roughly uh, 540 million years ago in the geological era called the Cambrian. Um, but the, the, first, uh, the very earliest account we have right now of something camouflage comes from Spain, and it's actually only 100, well, only 110 million years uh, old, which is a green lacewing uh, larva. So frozen into amber. Looks like this. And there is a um, reconstruction of it. So this is how the beast looks like. Um, so the idea here was, um, well, the, the way uh, camouflage worked, it, it had these structures, and leaves and um, dust and everything got stuck to it. So this animal just became a little ball of camouflage, ball of, uh, ball of its natural environment. Um, and this is how, um, we don't know how the adult looks like, but this is how green lace wings look uh, today. So other um, fossils of camouflage. So this is a leaf insect from Germany. So you can actually see, this is a modern leaf insect. And Faintly, you can see the outline here. Or um, this is a moth, 50 million years ago, uh, comes from 50 million years ago, and the reconstruction looks something like this. So, the, so this is another type of uh, coloration um, called um, flicker fusion. So the idea here is, is as this butterfly um, flies, um, this, is this is actually structural colors, so it's, it does, it's not, uh, not coming from uh, chemical pigments. It's actually the, the color is determined by the, the angle of the sun, uh, so the ang angle of uh, incident light. Um, so as this butterfly flies, this color actually changes, which creates this kind of flickery illusion, um, which some people say it's hard to track by if you are a predator. Um, in terms of humans, so one of the very first accounts uh, comes from Scotland. So this is, these people are wearing tartan, which is a special type of pattern. And George Buchanan, a historian, uh, talked about this um, in uh, 1582. Um, and he said that uh, these people were wearing these clothes in order to uh, stay hidden, either against um, game or uh, poachers. So these were um, shepherds of, uh, of Scotland. So, and tartan, so border tartan, the very first, very earliest tartan looks something like this. So some people say that this is actually, could be used as camouflage. Then uh, we jumped to the 19th century when uh, Britain started to use um, khaki, uh, which, is, which is just basically white um, shirts dyed into very different things. So at some point they were actually using blackberry juice to actually create these things. And then early 20th century camouflage had a big boom and um, various, various concepts um, started to arise. So people started to camouflage everything. So for example, tanks. In the First World War, the French army hired artists, uh, sculptors and painters to create these um, faint, uh, fake um, uh, obs uh, three observation posts. And some artists, um, especially from Cubism, uh, became interested in camouflaging uh, artillery positions uh, and guns uh, with um, very, very disruptive patterns. So because basically the idea of cubism is to break up the, uh, the form of an object, which comes very handy when you're trying to do camouflage. So cubism actually influenced uh, military a lot. So even these days, um, sometimes they um, color um, even aircraft, aircraft in uh, very, very disruptive kind of cubistic um, uh, colors. But the, um, one of the craziest application of, of cubism in, in war and in, um, in, in, the, in battlefields was um, thought by Norman Wilkinson, who came up with the idea that you can't hide battleships because they are very huge. So just make them very, very visible. And so this is from the First World War. And by making them too visible, you basically make it very, very hard to judge where they're heading 
and what their, sp what their speeds are. So hundreds and hundreds of ships were colored like this um, in, um, in the First World War. It was called Dazzle Coloration or Razzle Dazzle, as the Americans call it. Um, so they hired um, painters um, to um, supervise the, the creation of these ships. And as these convoys were um, um, sailing together on the sea, it was very, very hard to actually find a single ship if you are a submarine commander, German submarine commander, um, to actually aim at one specific ship. So this idea it actually comes from nature as well. You might have seen herds of zebras before. So as zebras move together, um, they are very, very visible, but it's very, very hard to actually pinpoint one individual from the herd. And obviously there are very, very funny applications as well. So these are Canadian fighters um, where they had this kind of fake cockpit painted on the underside. I've never, never understood why. Um, one of my favorites is actually beer. So this is how um, Rainier uh, Extra Pale Beer looked like uh, before uh, the Second World War. And they got, the, the company got um, asked by the military to actually camouflage, to so get, get rid of the colors, because they're really easy to spot where soldiers were, where, where active soldiers were, by looking at um, where these beer cans were. Um, so actually, well, I'm not looking at beer. I wish I, w I, I would, beer camouflage. But what I'm interested in in my PhD uh, are um, camouflage uniform patterns. So all these patterns come from different countries all around the world. Um, and as you can see, uh, there is a huge variability. Um, and I would ask, well, well why? And one because a straight answer would be, well, humans live in very, very different places. So no wonder they look different. But um, so these people, they all inhabit the kind of same temperate zone. So that's a, it's an American guy. Uh, Canada, Britain, um, Belarus, Poland, and uh, Ukraine. So they all live in temperate, well, these countries are all in like the temperate zone of the planet. So why do they look, the, the, um, why do they look uh, different? And one idea here is, again, comes from nature with this whole sexual selection thing, is that, yes, they want to stay camouflaged, they want, but they, want, they would like to say, they would like to stay similar to their friends, but different from their enemies. Um, so one actual example from history is, com uh, comes uh, just before um, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So these patterns, these countries, um, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and uh, Czechoslovakia, this meant to represent the Iron Curtain. And here are uh, the, the once enemies, the United States and Britain. So uh, these countries wanted to look very different from these, uh, from these countries. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, well, they were like, oh, let's be friends. Um, and what they did is everybody changed their camouflage patterns. Um, so again, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and now you can see the similarity. So it was a kind of political message. Um, just to quickly finish up, a um, couple of years ago, Slovakia changed their so-called digital pattern. And these are digital patterns, these pixelated ones. Um, and they all come from, um, the idea comes from Canada, who started to use it in the late uh, 90s. And then a lot of countries adopted it. So what pixelization means is that this is, a, this is Chinese camouflage. So they started up with this, then they pixelated it a bit, and then there was a complete pixelation happened in 2007. Um, countries like the United States, um, every branch of the military, uh, of the armed forces, has different camouflage. So Army, um, Marines, Navy, and the Air Force. And now they're trying to standardize it, but well, the Marines said they'd rather go naked into war than to wear the same thing as uh, what the army is wearing. And just, well, just one uh, funny instance, if you remember uh, Tartan. So we, this is, this is uh, 17th century. This is very new stuff. But if you compare, I mean, we come 300 years to, to produce something similar again to what we had 300 years ago. Um, so I look at... Um, 
the, the, the diversity, the kind of evolution of these patterns. So this is my sample. This is from a camouflage collector um, for over um, 1,200 patterns. So I spent a week photographing each of them. And this is how a photo what I use look like. And I use this bit. So that thing there, that color chart, is to make sure that all the colors are standardized across images. And what I do is I build similarity trees. So this is based on color. It's using a computer algorithm. And it groups, creates this tree of color similarity. So you can see these um, dark colors and these light colors. They all come to a different branch. Do the same thing with patterns. So now you can see all these pixelation, pixelated patterns. They are one group. Um, these blotchy things are another group. And, well, these are blotches as well, but be a different one. They're another group. Um, and what I'm working on right now is how, how can we add those things together, what the weighting should be uh, to create a, um, a color and pattern similarity tree. And then you can contrast this with history. There are many, many books on camouflage patterns, such as this excellent one on Soviet and Russian camouflage, where you can basically find the patterns and the name they were issued, so the, the, the year they were developed. Um, and then you can create something like this. So the idea here is that this is just time. And camouflage pattern that uh, was developed before can influence camouflage patterns that, were, that are more recent. And I'm basically trying to find out these weightings um, to get to this kind of history tree, uh, family tree of camouflage patterns. And then finally, I can ask questions, which I can hopefully find answers to. So what factors influence the cultural evolution of camouflage patterns? Um, things like do friends kind of converge over time? And the quite opposite, do enemies uh, escalate divergence in camouflage patterns? Um, and did patterns become more effective over time? Because as more and more money were spent on these patterns, one would expect that they got better. And thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so just to out. Um, my name is Zoe. I'm the creative director of something called the Institute of Making, which is a research institute at UCL. This is not for the camera, though. This is just Phil. No. You want it in the microphone? Okay. Will this come on automatically? Okay. I'll carry on then. So, yeah, my name's Zoe. I'm the creative director of the Institute of Making at UCL. And this is a research space for any staff or student of UCL to interrogate materials and make things. So part of what we do is collect stuff and enthuse about it, and I've been asked to talk about invisibility in relation to materials. 
Slide one. No. <laughs> okay. That's all right. I'll improvise. Um, we'll do something that will come up later. But in here, I've got... So invisibility, right, is about perception often. Like, there's things that aren't invisible. We just haven't seen them or we haven't known that they're there. So I would now show you a perception slide, but we can come back to that. But also things can be too big, okay? So lots of people, not lots of people get run over by buses, but if somebody gets run over by a bus, it's often because actually the, the bus is too big for them to see and it is, they are too close to that bus at the moment of stepping out on the pavement that they just didn't perceive edges of bus and didn't see the bus was there and just stepped straight out into the path of it. So sometimes things can be too big for us to see. Other times things can be too small for us to see. So in this jar here, I have some quantum dots. So these are nanoscale materials that are impossible to see in the with the naked eye and you need special equipment, and they're unimaginably small, basically. But they're there. I could pass them around, but there's kind of no point. But um, <laughs> shall I? Just so you feel you've held them in your hand. I'll pass them around. So yeah, quantum dots, unimaginably small. So often, scale can make things in, unable to be seen. It's not going to happen, is it? But there's also a failure of perception, right? So you can, you all know of sounds you can't hear. Um, like, you know, it's too high for the human hearing, but dogs hear them and things. So things can be off our scale of perception, but also in the same way that you can have light that you can't see. So I think let's just scrap it. Uh, it, it did like it, it loved it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't like it now, we're rejecting it. I'm in the groove now without anything. So we've got um, things that are t uh, too small, things that are too big, sounds you can't hear because our mode of perception doesn't, isn't designed to then pick up those frequencies. It's not that they don't exist, we just haven't perceived them. But also then there's things that we can't see, even though that it's, they contain light. So I was just thinking, if you take any banknote, you look at it, you think you're seeing the whole picture, but actually there's markings on there that are invisible, but they're designed to be seen in a different condition, which is under a UV light. So that's why in a shop they might take your note if you're looking particularly suspicious that, that day, they might check your money and put it under a little UV light reader, and what will happen is that the, uh, a blue letter, you know, blue digits, one and zero, if this is a £10 note, will appear. If it's a 20, a blue two and zero will appear. And there's some other little markings that will appear. And if you're, like, in a nightclub or something, maybe just get your money out and have a look. Cause, or if you're in a toilet, they often use UV lights to stop people injecting themselves. Because you, um, under blue light, blue things will then disappear. So you can't, it's very difficult to find a vein um, in your arm if you're trying to look for one under blue light. So they'll use blue light to make invisible the blueness of the veins in your arm. All useful tips to take away with you. Um, <laughs> the things you do when you don't have your slides. Right, so things you can't see, things you can see. So uh, then in, but in terms of materials, it's quite difficult to think of material that you can't see unless it's just very, very small, right? But actually, we're surrounded by a material we can't see. We'll just call it air, but it has elements in it of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, etc. But this is air as a material around us, and we can't see it. But there's other air we can see and things we can do to kind of make it more apparent. So, oh, it's very cold. This is why you need kind of like a Madonna microphone. Oh, this is a good technique. Okay, so this... Oh, a bit too much of it. This is... This is um, solid carbon dioxide, otherwise known as dry ice, which is about minus 70 centigrade. Now, CO2 does something. We can pass this around if you keep it moving, OK? Do you want to pass it around? Catch. <laughs> OK. Um, CO2 does something called subliming. And subliming is a process, you know at school when you like, states of matter, you go from solid, you heat it up, it becomes a liquid, keep heating, it becomes a gas. Stuff goes solid, liquid, gas, and then you cool it down and it goes from gas to liquid back to solid. That's the kind of standard progression of matter when it gets hot or cools down. But CO2 doesn't do that. This is in its solid state. As it warms up, 
it never becomes a liquid. It just goes solid gas. It doesn't have that liquid phase. And that process of a material going from solid to gas is sublimation, is sublime. So we're watching some sublime moments here. But just to prove that there's a gas being deposited in there, um, CO2 is heavier than air. Okay, so it's more dense than the air around us. Put that back on properly. So it's more dense than the air around us, and so is settling in there. It's not sort of just mingling freely with the air above it. It's sitting in there and slowly filling up that chamber. So to prove that, I'll just open these bubbles. Maybe I should move it in more in the spotlight, more dramatic, Zoe, come on. Feel free to stand up. Can the camera see? No, the camera can't see. Could the camera see there? I'll keep it there. Sorry, everybody at home. Okay. I know at least one person watching live. Hi, Sue. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I've rubbish. I haven't got anything in there. It was invisible. How would I know? It's clear liquid. I missed. Oh, right. Oh, I've blown in there and it's created smoke. Hang on. I'm blowing two bigger bubbles, and I think I've got too much air in, too much gas in there. Let me just empty some out. I know, I know, this is ludicrous, isn't it? Ah, oh, now, there, look, watch. Now, this little chap, he's now floating on, on the CO2. I've, I've emptied too much out now. It's emptied too much out. So it's floating on the bed of the CO2 gas. Um, it's difficult. I want to come at it from a distance, maybe. Catch some. It works really well with a big fish tank where you've got a large area to aim at. Any seven year olds here? <laughs> this is a, it's a long time since I've blown some bubbles. Ah, okay. Yes. Oh. It's so, we'll let it fill up a bit. We'll let it fill up and we'll return to that. But essentially, the bubbles will bounce around and just float yeah, on that interface of the CO2 and the air around us. I'll put a bit more in and keep talking. Okay. So, CO2, sublimation, gas. But there's also, you can talk about invisibility in terms of some liquids. So, there, this is just water, but... Actually, there could be all sorts of other liquids mixed in that that are also clear and you wouldn't know. But actually, there are... Can the camera see this? Can the camera see this? Inside this glass of water, there is in... Water? <laughs> Inside this glass of water, there, there is, in fact, a solid. So I just... In fact, not just one solid. Can you see that? Hang on. You ready? but lots and lots of what's called invisible balls. If I drain the water out... Oh, Jesus, microphone technique. OK, now you can start to see the balls appearing. Oh, there's the balls. Water, watch them disappear. Oh, it's a terrible pour of this cup. OK, so, essentially, this is a material that has the same refractive index as water. So that means light passes through the water at the same angle in which it would... Um, through, sorry, through the, the balls. The light passes through this material at the same uh, angle of refraction as it would through water. So you know if you put a straw in water, it actually... Water does bend light slightly, and that's why you'll see the straw look a bit kind of kinked and wonky inside the liquid. So that bend is continued through those balls in the same way as it would if it had just gone through the water. So for all intents and purposes, you just don't see them because it's, the light is behaving the same way in both materials. Okay, so, but these, these sort of have a kind of wondrous property about them, but they're in fact very every day. They're um, used by florists in flower arranging where they want to have a, um, a few delicate stems in some water and they hold the stems up, so they just sort of fill them with this. But they start life 
as these hard little beads and then you tip them into water and they hydrate. So I rather got a bit overexcited earlier. <laughs> and I, I tipped um, probably, probably half this amount of balls into this jar, of, this thing of water. And they just kept swelling and coming out. This is full of them, this is full of them. Like, it really got out of hand. Um, but I thought, let's have a good look at them. So can you sort of see... Can you see that they're there? A bit. Sometimes on the top it's more impressive. But let's just tip it out and see all the balls. So I'm, drain, I'm trying to drain the water out and leave the balls in. So that's pretty much now jam-packed with these kind of marbles, but then we can just... No, I'll keep them in here. <laughs> I don't know how they're going to dispose of them. That will get drunk in the bar or something by accident. Okay. So invisible balls. Dry my hands. Um, and I was then going to show you a slide of something called the invisibility cloak. So this is not something I have with me, but any Harry Potter aficionado knows that this is the sort of one of the objects of magic of the Harry Potter novels. But... And so in some ways it's that sort of science fiction fantasy, but it has been kind of made, right? It exists, but it doesn't produce invisibility of visible light. It produces invisibility of microwaves. So it enables objects to be clad with this shield and be invisible to detection by radar and things like that. But it's, the shield itself is incredibly visible. So it was going to be my last slide of something that produces invisibility, but is clearly obvious <laughs> and um but it's so it's not at all invisible to you and i but is invisible to the the eye of a radar or a microwave detector let me just have one more try at this then i'll i'll leave you to it okay oh damn it i think they're going too big aren't they yes oh one one bubble doing it come on the bubble thank you very much <laughs>
sorry, everybody, we'll resume just as soon as John gets back. <laughs> Do you want to sit down or do you want to stand? Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll remain standing. Okay. Do you want to hold the microphone in your hand then? No. You need to hold it quite close to your mouth. Okay. Perhaps I will sit down. Are the yeah. others sitting down? I'll uh, sit down. There's an old Zen koan which is meant to train you in realising that you are nothing. The idea is that you start looking at your feet or your shoes and very slowly you look upwards to your knees and you keep looking upwards till you come to your this to a shirt, you keep looking upwards, and then a strange thing happens, you disappear. <laughs> and this is supposed to, with repeated repetitions, is supposed to remind you that you are essentially nothing. Now, I had that uh, device, that, that koan, as, as they're called, much in my mind, when I was losing my sight. The idea rather haunted me that uh, as my, my range of vision diminished slowly, my feet got a bit tricky to see. Um, and I was haunted by the idea that finally I would become invisible. The strange loss of the human face was a factor in this. During the time when I uh, was losing my sight, by the way, I'm one of a very small number of totally blind people who have no light sensation at all. I had this vision, or this, this daymare, I suppose you might call it, 
that I was coming along to the National Portrait Gallery and as I walked along the pictures, there'd be a blank where there was a name under where the picture had been but no picture. This, I realised, was my way, the way of my imagination in telling me that the people I knew fell into two classes. Those that had faces, they were the people I knew before I lost my sight, and those who had no faces, those were the people I had come to know since I lost my sight. This little imaginative ploy, however, concerned me greatly because every time I went to the gallery, the number of portraits diminished and the number of blanks on the walls increased. You see, I lost my sight very slowly over a period of about 10 years. I knew that one day I would come to the National Gallery and find it closed because there wouldn't be a single picture on display. At that point, I became defiant, so to speak. I said to myself, well, all the portraits will go, but there's one portrait I will never lose, I thought. However, already at that stage, the face of the, the person I loved was already becoming difficult to, to visualise. She was becoming invisible, bit by bit. I found that by concentrating upon an old picture, I somehow could remember the, the photograph. And I said to myself, I will take that picture, I will nail it in the deepest part of my heart, and I will never forget it. Later on, I changed my mind. I'll tell you why in a minute. It's strange how, as things become invisible, they become so unpredictably and irregularly. What I mean, well, I suppose, I suppose the marvellous speakers that have already addressed us would find this quite intelligible. To me, it was a surprise. You see, I got to a stage where I could walk home at night from my office to my house by following the double yellow lines on the side of the road. For some reason, they stood out. Also, the contrast between the green of the lawn and the, the, the notch green of the pavement enabled me to follow that line. Gradually, however, even that became more and more difficult. There was the time when I could no longer see my own face. Well, you may say there are some advantages in blindness. Well, perhaps so. I couldn't see my face. This then reminded me again of the old koan. I'd become invisible. I began to feel that I was like a ring wraith in Lord of the Rings. And the same happened to other people. Uh, at the end of a day, I sometimes couldn't remember if I'd been talking to a person face to face or on the telephone. You see, when you sight of people, remember the conversations you've had, they're always placed against a background, aren't they? Of the library walls or the tree or whatever you were when, uh, when you had that conversation. For me, there is no such background. All I have is the voice. And I couldn't remember what the context of the voice. I can hear the voice, but where was it? The voices themselves had somehow become invisible. Of course, I reached the stage finally where everything had become invisible. But on the way to that uh, final destination, excuse me, there were one or two moments when my ability to interpret the situation was punctuated by little snatches of conversation. It's funny how in the crisis of your life, sometimes a little thing that somebody says somehow makes such an impression on you. I'm sure you've all experienced that. One night, Marilyn and I were having a deep conversation and she said something which has stuck with me always. The trouble you see, the trouble, she said, 
is not with you. The problem is not that you have become blind. The problem is that I, meaning yourself, I have become invisible. Indeed, when Ben invited me to give this talk, my first response was that Marilyn should give it because she's the one who has become invisible. And when she said that, I thought, how neat, how she turns the tables on me. <laughs> she's laughing. Stop laughing. This is serious. <laughs> how neatly. And I thought then, what must it be like for a lovely woman, yes, not to be able to display her beauty to the man who loves her. Oh, yes, okay, I can hear what you're saying. You're saying, oh, well, there's perfume. Yes, but half the time the bastard doesn't notice it. So what's the point of having your hair done, of dressing up nicely when you've become invisible? The philosopher Berkeley believed that to be is to perceive. And in a strange way, not to hold each other in each other's eyes, that way that sighted people have of glancing at each other, is in a very important way to cease to exist. I was going to tell you why I stopped trying to remember the photograph, wasn't I? Um, there was another little incident. I was at a party one night and a friend of mine came up and said, John, I think there's something you should know. Yes, I said cautiously. I think you should know, he said, that tonight Marilyn is looking particularly beautiful. He went on. He made it worse. He said, you see, John, you will never see those first grey hairs. You will never see those little wrinkles. To you, she will always be as young and beautiful as she was when you married her. This filled me with a deep sense of anger. Indeed, I, I could have hit him, except I'm not the kind of goes, guy that goes around hitting people. Anyway, you know, when you're blind, it's easy to hit and miss, so... <laughs> I have to be careful. I talked to Marilyn about this afterwards and she said, that's strange. Some of my women friends are telling me the same sort of thing. One said to me the other day, you know, Marilyn, in a way you are lucky. John will never see you get older. To him, you will always be as young and beautiful as you were. It was that time which made a crisis in the lives of both of us, not a crisis of love, but a, a, a crisis of worlds. I was moving into a world which was invisible to her and she was remaining in that world which had become invisible to me. At that point, I had to decide what did I do? Did I live in nostalgia? I thought to myself, must I always go upon a detour through nostalgic memory in order to relate to the person I love. And I said, no, I will not live in memory. I will not live in nostalgia. I will embrace invisibility. I will embrace blindness. I will become a blind man. And I will live in reality with this sighted woman and we will learn how the two human worlds, in their separation, can also meet. A strange thing then gradually happened over a number of years. Things started to become visible again. I discovered that so slowly. Trees became visible again when I walked into them. <laughs> And I learned to love the roughness of their bark. Huh? I learned to love the rain and the film which Peter Middleton has made shows a beautiful scene of that. 
You see, I discovered, well, it was a particular night in our house. There was a fierce rainstorm and I pressed my nose against the little panes of window in the, in the window and I heard the little panes of glass all giving off different notes according to how firmly they were set in the little kind of window frame things. I listened intently. Outside, I could hear the rain splashing on the trees and the bushes, on the path leading down to the road. I could hear the swishing of the cars as they went along the road. I could even hear the dull, the dull murmur of the rain falling on the houses on the other side of the road. And indeed, across the whole city, there was the low murmur of rain. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. It was a restoration from invisibility into the visible. And so I have learned that visibility is not only connected with one's eyes, there is a, there is a visibility of touch, there is a visibility of sound. One loses and somehow one regains it. Not in quite the same fullness of detail, but with a strange, small kind of beauty. Thank you. I'll stay there. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Does, does anybody have any questions for any of the three panellists? I'll pass you the microphone. Or maybe you have any, some questions for each other as well, because you haven't had a chance to discuss together. I'd like to ask you, John, about your perceptions of texture. And you, you described the tree, and I noticed you touching the base of the microphone stand in front of you. And as someone who's myself very materially and feels quite touch orientated, I'm curious to know whether you've um, discovered new mental, Im do you have a mental image of those textures or do you then just rate them against the physicality of them each time now? Yes, or do thank you build them back into something? Yes, thank you, Zoe. I need to hold the microphone so I don't bump into it. I mean, it's partly a matter of locating it, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Because with the microphone, it's important just to get the distance right. But about textures, textures. Yes, I, I found that uh, things somehow became beautiful to touch in themselves, and I found a lot of sighted people find that hard to grasp. I'll give you a little example. I go to a, uh, a cathedral visit. The guide would take me, take me along to an intricate piece of carving. And he'd say, now this is a little carving of rose bushes and leaves. And in the middle here, he'd put my finger on it, there's a head of a little fish poking out. Isn't that wonderful? Now, <laughs> it would have taken me half an hour to work that out. In the meantime, I suddenly stretched my hand out and there was the smooth metal of the altar rail. And I walked right across it and it was beautiful. You see what I mean? In a way, sighted people look for meaning in all the, all the time, in touch. But I think for me, I mean the touch of the smoothness of this table edge is, is somehow the roundness of this glass. It, it's somehow beautiful. Of course, there's nothing a blind person can do that a sighted person can't do, but I sometimes think that when, you, when everything is invisible to you, these rather trivial little sensations are come, somehow acquire a kind of intensity 
And that's where the beauty lies, I think. We've done some um, studies at the Institute of Making where we have looked at what's called thermal conductivity. So essentially, when you touch something, how cool is it or how warm is it? Also, combining that with texture, and we've been able to, in blindfolding sighted people, trick them into thinking they're touching wood when they're touching glass by changing the temperature and texture of the glass. So it, it's sort of exploring that multimodal, as it would be described, the complexity of what you are touching when you're touching, the combinations of temperature, texture, acoustics. You know, you know, you can judge thickness and you can sense, is it hollow? Is the wall behind us supporting the, 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 the way in which those properties are read by us all, all of the time? Actually, really interesting. And I think it's nice to hear from you. That's amazing. I, I've always thought that uh, we talk about optical illusions. I've often wondered whether there are tactile illusions. Yeah, that's what we're trying yeah. to We're making some. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Most intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I want to ask kind of a related question to um, the guy who was talking about uh, his blindness. I want to know whether you, um, whether you ha uh, keep mental images um, in the same way that you did when you were sighted or whether you've ceased to be bothered about them at all. Yes, thank you. Of course, you'll realise that my mental imagery has no colour. Um, my images have no movement but they are three-dimensional images of shapes. Uh, I mean, for example, with this glass here, um, a, a curious thing about uh, three-dimensional imagery, things don't change when you turn them in different directions. Whereas for a sighted person, I don't do this now because there's water in the glass, but you see what I mean. If you, when, you, when you turn it over, a plate, it gets narrow, doesn't it, as you look at it from the side? But with tactile images, they don't change. And another curious thing about them is that with, with visual images, they get smaller as they get further away from you. Tactile images don't do that. They just disappear, <laughs> which is weird. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask another question, John. You mentioned um, to be is to perceive. And I'm just curious, I don't know, you sound a very erudite uh, man. And I'm just curious, um, were, did you have a, a strong sense of intuition before you went blind? And has your intuition heightened since you lost your sight? And in, in terms of your perception, are, are you a little bit more spot on now? Do you perceive more now, if that makes sense? Yes, that's interesting. That's a hard thing. Marilyn has sometimes said to me, don't exaggerate the extent to which sighted people can see. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, intuition. Yes, I, I have come to realise that I, I think... Uh, hmm. I used to do a lot of interviewing with a sighted colleague when I was in the university, and my impressions, of course, would be entirely the voice. Um, but afterwards, when we compared notes, I would find that my estimation of the character of the candidate wouldn't be any different from that of the sighted person, and sometimes better. So that's made me, I think, very sensitive to the human qualities of voices. Of course, it takes longer to, to acquire uh, a memory image of a voice, whereas sight is so instantaneous, isn't it? Uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a hard, I'll have to think about that. Thanks for asking it. Has, has your voice changed? <coughs> Maybe we should ask Marion. Has your voice changed? Has my own voice changed? In terms of, you, had, you have fantastic delivery and intonation oh, and pacing. Do I? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Coming I from think you. we would all agree. Uh, but, Coming uh, from Zoe, that's quite a compliment. <laughs> but I think that, that is that something that you feel you may have developed because it's more of a tool now, because you can understand it as other people's tool? Oh. Well, you're, you're baffling me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Here's a thing I meant to ask Peter, Peter Middleton, who's the 
producer of the uh, film, um, the film, uh, the soundtrack of the film is very largely taken from voice recordings I made during the time I was losing my sight. Well, no, it was after I deeply lost my sight. I started to keep uh, uh, record uh, memos, notes on an old cassette recorder, sort of way of monitoring what was happening to me. And Pete persuaded me to dig these out. You know, after 30 years, I found them, and they've become the soundtrack of the film. And just listening to them uh, the other day on YouTube, I couldn't help thinking to myself how sombre I sound. I don't know whether you've thought about this, Pete. I do sound sombre, whereas I think when I'm talking to people in normal conversation like now, I don't sound particularly sombre, I hope not. Uh, but that's because those recordings were made alone when I was in deep meditative mood. I wasn't talking to anybody. And so there's a difference of style, I think. Yes, I, I, guess, I guess I have learnt more how to project my voice a little bit. I don't know. This question is for John. Um, as human beings, we judge what we find attractive or beautiful or sensual, uh, generally based on the way that they look. Um, since you don't have that to work with, I wanted to know what it was using your other senses that made you find things beautiful or find things attractive or find things sensual. For example, um, with Marion, you know, is there anything about the way she smells or the way that she sounds or not just when it comes to another person but with anything? What exactly makes you attracted to something because it, if you cannot see it? Yes. At first I did mourn the loss of visual beauty and I thought of sunsets and rays of light coming down through forests, you know, all of these things that we sighted people find beautiful. And I think, well, looking back, I'd say that my, my sense of, of the hand uh, passed through, through three stages. I, it didn't seem like that at the time, but looking back, I mean, uh, sighted people use their hands to hold things. Uh, Blind people use, use their hands to know things. For example, I found it would take both hands to get a key into a Yale lock. It's a bit like being drunk. Um, it was some time, however, before I discovered the, the beauty of, of the hand. That is the beauty of touching things. Oh, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Oh, beauty, yes. Anything in particular, like whether you favor smells. Oh, yes, I know. I've thought of some examples. I love noisy weather. <laughs> to me, it's a nice day if there's lots of thunder, hail, you know. I love the wind in the trees, you see. I mean, if there's no sound, there's no roof on the world. There's just nothing. There's just my feet on the floor. But the moment the thunder comes, whoosh, I'm in a place. You know, thunder is my roof. That's a wonderful feeling of excitement and pleasure. And you ask about people, well, of course, uh, the human voice is so delightful, isn't it? And sometimes you, you hear a, a human voice which is so full of charisma and of eros that it is charming. I think that's certainly developed more. And of course, senses of space and fragrance, smells, smell of fir trees, Yes, I guess, I guess one becomes a bit like a dog, you know, you get more, 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 more sensitive to smell and places like that. Yes, I think it's a gradual process of adaptation. Let's say rabbits, wild, wild hare. Um, so they live in rabbit holes, and they are the, this famous example of hiding. But they do have to come out eventually. So I don't think the two things are, are related to each other. So if, if, something, if something, let's say, is hiding constantly, living in a cave, for example, it won't develop camouflage, 
because there is no reason to do it because there is no light around. But things that <coughs> have to go out and forage, have to find food, they will be in the plain sight of a predator at some point. Is that answers your question? I mean, because if we, if we don't have this, we would call camouflage, we would call everything camouflaged when we just can't see it because of anything. So occlusion would be camouflage yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a question for Laszlo as well. Um, I made some notes uh, um, when you were talking about camouflage to do with uh, hiding in plain sight, background matching, masquerade, and Batesian mimicry. Yes. I was wondering if, um, are these things separated from human behavior? Um, because a lot of these things made me think of things to do with more anthropological or sociological aspects um, in, in sort of human society. And that seemed to be something that you didn't talk about or is, is that a kind of separate area of study from what you do? Um, so Maybe behavioral I science. I outline or those as the kind of basic principles of camouflage. Um, my study in itself is not really concerned about uh, what sort of um, techniques are used in human camouflage. Uh, it's just basically the development of it. And, and I'm more interested in similarity than actually in effectiveness. I'm, I'm interested in a bit, and I, I will discover that to some extent. But I'm more interested in similarity um, and how things evolved together. Um, I mean, you can find these, these concepts in many, many, many um, aspects of life. So there is a whole um, section of camouflage poetry, which I, which is, I found a bit distinct to, to this talk, but um, I didn't mention it. Um, but you mentioned like so sociological um, um, aspects. And the, the thing with camouflage is, um, well, I find it really hard to actually summarize in 20 minutes, is it's such a diverse thing in, in in life and in, in society that um, it, it's, it's everywhere. Um, well, I guess you've just answered my next question, but I was just wondering if, is, is, is in dealing particularly with human activity, is that, what kind of area would that be? Is it behavioral science or is it, can it just go into so many different areas? It obviously depends on the context. Yes, it's, it's a bit weird because my study, well, my project, probably belongs to anthropology. Yeah, anthropology is the only people I haven't really talked to yet. Um, so, um, yes, there is, um, yeah, I would say anthropology. It's probably the closest thing that, that, that would cover it. But I'm really interested in the kind of scientific aspect of it and how you can actually, um, so the, the thing is camouflage is just an example we use for cultural evolution. Um, so there are, in the, in the past 10, 15 years, people, when people got interested in how, how is it possible to actually measure um, not biological but cultural evolution, they used a lot of um, different things such as language um, or even, uh, even textiles, not camouflage textiles, but like um, t tapestry and carpets um, or uh, political concepts or scientific concept. But the problem with those is that you can follow through what happened, but you don't know the driving factor. So uh, you can follow through all these languages, you know, how um, uh, like Anglo-Saxon languages or Indo-European languages diverse, but you don't know what's the drive, why language is diverse. And the reason we chose in camouflage uh, is because you can actually pinpoint these um, factors that drive it. So function would be concealment, and you got this recognition bit. And those are the two main things that drive camouflage forward, and you can measure these things. Um, you know, if I ask you what's the function of language, you would probably name at least 20, 25 different things, and it would be very hard to say. So yeah, camouflage is just a neat concept to follow through um, cultural evolution. Is there a last question? No? Uh, so I'd just like to thank uh, Zoe, John and Laszlo. Thank you so much for coming this evening and speaking to us all.